All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Spare Room Talks. My name is Kareem. We have Amin and our special guest in the building, Mr. Thomas Arnold. What's cracking, peeps? The man, the myth, the legend. Welcome. <laughs> definitely, definitely the legend. I think, part, I think anyway. we can wrap it up there. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it, man. I'm, that's done. It. I'm done. Do you have any other questions? That's pretty much it, man. I just wanted to I'll see you guys next here. week. <laughs> Bye. Honestly, it's crazy. Yeah. No, but thanks for coming, man. Anytime, boys. Appreciate it. Both legends. Love. <laughs> Exactly. Love. We have many good chats about social media and stuff. So we, it's, we we do we I do we do indeed, and it's worthwhile to get some of it on camera for once. I think our problem is that we usually have chats that are not recorded, and so this is our effort to kind of record one of them. Yeah, and you know because we're always like learning so much. Exactly. So this is the time to kind of get it on on video. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 100%. Exactly. I guess for um the very few people who may be listening to for this for the ninety nine point nine percent of the world who does not know who I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Quick backstory. Who are you? What are you doing now? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm Thomas yeah. Arnold. I'm 21 years of age, currently doing commerce in UCD, which is like a business course. Uh, I'm in third year on internship in Microsoft. I've been vlogging for three years, doing social media since I was around 14. And other than working, I do YouTube and do freelance videography to get a bit of extra cash. Um, and I have big interests in social media and business. En général. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in Paris last week and I love French. Je yeah. fais la vaisselle. Do you, do you speak French? I do indeed. Oh, oh really? God. Uh, <laughs> I should have said that in French. That would have been <laughs> far more. Go on, go on. That's pretty sick. Yeah, All right, wait, wait. You said start social media when you were 14. What does yeah. that mean? So I used to do cricket videos when I first started off. I guess it's sort of interesting. There's a lot of people now who want to start personal brands or start their social media accounts and they don't know where to start. When I was 14, I loved playing cricket. And when I searched stuff online, there was a lot of articles to do with how to do stuff, yeah. but there was nobody making videos about it. So I'd say huh. I'm just going to rip content off the internet. So how to do, how to, how to ball off spin. And I'm going to convert that into a video. And all of a sudden there was a bit of an audience for it. So it was a year and a half. I did 25 of them, got 200,000 views <laughs> and wow. stopped when I realized I wasn't like an expert in that field, but that was my first foray into social media. That's that's crazy because like if you how many views, two hundred thousand off twenty five, that's, and that's crazy for for like for the kind of people who would be looking at cricket videos in Ireland, yeah, like seven and years it, ago. It got was views it, because why, of search why was terms. That? Like was it what, search terms? Search terms, yeah. So it's the same reason how you can grow a channel today if you're doing. Let's say, for example, we'll take tech channels. They'll do videos based on iPhone unboxes. Um, new technologies that are coming out that's because people are searching for it so it's the same thing with you know you know google adwords you're you're paying for stuff in that respect it was the same with cricket so when i put up how to bowl i can't remember what i used to call them how to put swing in a cricket ball how to uh bowl off spin they're all just search terms that people were clicking anyway so they didn't care about me you know they weren't coming for thomas arnold's it was for the They're search term. For the actual term but obviously through that they got to they got to know the uh you wouldn't really have tom. wanted to get to know the 14 year old tom of course <laughs> <laughs> ultimately yeah that's sort of the purpose of it as well um no, so yeah that's crazy so in, in, in that case then where did you like were you willingly or like knowingly making videos that would target specific terms that you had in mind or was it just like almost like a coincidence that you're just generally interested in showing people how to do this thing and it turned out that it worked really well because it actually matched some terms that a lot of people were looking for it was coincidental i think the the reason why i'd talk about or i'd make those videos was i had a notepad with a list of the different things that i could make and I was literally going through my head thinking, what are the different things that I've learned from getting coached? Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, there's three different areas of cricket. There's fielding, batting and bowling. Nobody really cares about fielding. So I only made two videos to do with that. It was all batting and bowling. And then I just go through YouTube and see if there was any other videos and then just copy their titles. And if it wasn't there, then I'd use a new term. So all those videos are privated now because I don't want yeah. people to know my 14 year old self. But this, this <laughs> Good call. <laughs> how to ball a ball with swing. That had like 40,000 views because there was nobody who had done that. And it was like a good thumbnail with my face and the ball like this. So yeah, um, that, yeah that's nice. insane. So so w where did it take you from there? Because like, it's, it's really interesting that you mentioned that because I feel that a lot of people would just be creating videos on the internet, you know, just, just for the sake of it without targeting it in any way. And you're absolutely right in the sense that if, if you're seriously looking to grow a channel or grow your presence online, um, regardless if, if it's video or not, you have to be addressing something that people are already looking for. 
rather than just you know promoting yourself especially when no one knows you that's so true because people put in a lot of effort in in creating the videos obviously and waiting for that kind of you know moment of truth and then it just falls on deaf ears 100 percent. yeah like so after i was done when i was 14 i started back up again when i was 18 but on the point that you just said i sort of was doing that with my channel for probably a year and a half i was trying to get people to come to me based on me even though i didn't have a lot of subscribers and because youtube and all social media is so saturated now you to get yourself from zero to something you're gonna have to be way more tactful with how you do stuff so i was i guess now that i'm a bit older i've been trying to it's only over the past four or five months that i've really grown so i've gone from like i'm on the cusp of 10k but i've gone from 5 to 10k probably in three months and that's from again doing videos based on t not only titling but relevant events in society yeah so when Krispy Kreme came to Blanche I saw shout it on out. my shout out, <laughs> shout out Krispy Kreme oh man we have a whole story about that but let's not get into that just yet <laughs> um my friend Alex Plamadila had it on his story yeah and I was due to make a video that weekend about something random I think it was I was going to film it in Stevens Green and when I saw it I was thinking oh this is brilliant I did a bit of a Google search that there was some journal articles coming out that this American franchise has come to Blanche. These people are queuing in Blanche, blah, 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 blah. So I was like, great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Krispy Kreme. I call it Krispy Kreme came to Ireland. Nice. So the Krispy Kreme search term that everybody's looking at and Ireland as well. And then uh, I'll make a video, make sure the branding is in it. Mm. So for anybody who has seen maybe if in fitness, yeah. some people are doing 24 hours eating Ben and Jerry's, 24 hours eating McDonald's. Like all, all these like 10,000 calorie things or yeah. like, what, like what it, challenges and so on. Yeah. 10K, 10K calorie challenge is more of a trend. Oh, you're, you're talking about specific, like associating a specific brand name with it. 100%. Nice. It's like easily recognizable yeah. when you see McDonald's and Subway and it's more easy for people to click onto it. Mm -hmm. So some of the people to understand is that if they've never ever come across you before and you're coming up in the recommended you've got to make something that they'll unconsciously click on because they're not going to think nobody has enough time to actually think about what's going on yeah. they just look at the thumbnail then they look at the title then they look at the thumbnail again and if the thumbnail is like yeah i want to click on that based on the title they'll just click it straight away just like that yeah i mean it's something that would pique their curiosity i suppose yeah and that's the reason why the Krispy Kreme one did well. And on top of that, if anybody wants to get more tactful beyond the, the title and thumbnail, it's that's the primary thing to get people into the funnel. The second thing is that on the first two lines of the description, you want to put, they're like your tags. So any videos you want your video to be recommended from, you put that through the tags. So what I okay. did was I type in Krispy Kreme into YouTube and took the first top 10 search results and copied and pasted those titles into the description. So when those videos come up, uh, mine will hopefully be recommended. So that's so you, you're oh Mars. man, yo Wait, hold on. So so you oh, would, so to recap, you would actually look at the videos that are already ranking for that, copy the titles, paste them as tags in addition to all the other tags that we're optimizing for, and and that way you stand a chance of actually getting uh, recommended on the feed on the right side. So you, you'd literally copy the descriptions of like the top three, five, ten videos and put it into your own description. Yeah. Would it just be the... So hold on, hold on, hold on. Is it the title <laughs> or the description that goes in the tag? Pardon? Would you put the title or the description or both? Uh, both. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So like a more recent example, I did a Rob Lipset video. If you type in Rob or if you type in my name right now into YouTube, related videos will come up of rob and that's because basically that video is on like thirty two thousand views now it's it was on 24 last night so it's just growing wow, growing wow. growing but the reason is because for a video to go viral on youtube you need two things right so okay. youtube only cares about watch time yes watch time is the the session that someone uses on the platform because if i can keep you on and on an hour on your channel versus 15 minutes on yours i can serve you more ads and make more money mm -hmm. so how do i get you to watch something for a long amount of time i need two things basically how, how do i figure out what's good watch time it's view duration multiplied by clicks per impression so view duration is nice. what's the average time someone watches your video yeah. and number two out of per 100 people how many people click on it yeah mm -hmm. so for my rob video it has twice the amount of um click-through rates uh, it's like ctr for google adwords yeah. so it has twice the click-through rate of Krispy Kreme, and it has an average view duration of eight minutes so when you multiply those two together, 
that's I, I don't know what the uh, maths is, but it's good. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> the math is great. Yeah, the math is very good. So yeah. YouTube doesn't care about likes and dislikes or comments, as people may really? think, because okay. comments aren't necessarily a correlation to more watch time. Now, there's exceptions to that rule where you have someone like Emma Chamberlain, who's a massive vlogger in America, mm -hmm. and Jaffa Man 04, who's like an Irish one who's blown up. Yeah he's getting so much virality because his topics are very general. He's hilariously funny and he's aged down his demographic to young girls and girls are very good at spreading something really quick if they love it. Mm -hmm. That's why some of these massive American vloggers have crazy fan bases and crazy engagement because the younger you, you go down, just like Jake and Logan Paul like, did. Yeah, I was, I was thinking just there. They're so much more engaged than older people. Like when you're, you become old fogies like us, we're just less likely to comment. Like I wouldn't comment on people's videos unless they were my friends, you know? Because yeah. we're just like, oh, I couldn't be arsed. So, um, so, so it basically boils down to how long they, like as a portion of the, your video, watch time in total, multiplied by the percentage of people that would actually click through on it. Yeah. So that's, that's why your thumbnail and titles are so important. Because otherwise your click, if you have a good watch time, but nobody's clicking on your video, then, or if, if you have good view duration, but no, nobody clicking into it, it's not, you need both sides of the puzzle to work. That's actually really interesting then. So um, in your instance, so you, you gave the example of like how you'd actually label your video, like thumbnail, um, headline, and then the actual like description and so on. But like comparing that to something like the Rob Lipset video, you're saying that compared to your Krispy Kreme video, which was also like quite popular, um, it might had a much, it was increasing by a lot more like day over day and also um, like as a percentage of people seeing the actual video as a suggestion and clicking on it, it was still higher. So what, what do you think caused that in comparison to the what was it? What one? do you think it's mainly like the name Rob Lipset or? Yeah. So the, one of the original reasons why I made the video of Rob was because his name is like a good search title. Cause even in his own channel, he'll put his name like Rob Lips at full day of eating because he's, it's funny. He's like indirectly collaborating with himself. So yes. if Rob yeah. was to make a video with, um, let's think of another fitness influencer like Glenn Gillen. Mm -hmm. If, um, if he puts a video saying Rob Lips at featuring Glenn Gillen Q and a, he knows that Glenn's name is going to rank and try and bring recommended videos to him. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, when I was putting the video out, I knew that Rob would generate a bit of search traffic based on two videos I've made previous with him when I was filming him. So it was called filming with Rob Lips. It mm -hmm. has like seven K and then filming with Rob Lips it again. Or sorry, film with Rob Lipset dot 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 again, exclamation points, has like 4K. So I decided to do one with him. I can't remember the original point of your question though. <laughs> yeah, no. So what, why do you think that video compared to other videos like just had a much sort of was went for lack of a better word viral yeah i, th I call them like high performing yeah. videos because viral is like millions of views Ooh. but uh, <laughs> yeah, makes sense, makes sense, yeah. yeah but like i do it as well yeah. i call everything viral but it's i think what we mean is like getting a lot of views so yeah yeah um i think it was a combination of a high click-through rate yeah. um good title and thumbnail his name being in the search and also like it's driving a lot of uh it's it's a very polarizing video so okay Basically what I did for people who haven't seen it, I, I've loved fitness for like three or four years and I followed Rob for that time and nice. I filmed him before. And I was like, oh, it'd be very interesting to ask one of the biggest influencers in the country some questions about touchy subjects that people don't normally address. Okay. So stuff like steroids, stuff like um, relationships and social media, stuff like, uh, what else did I ask him? Uh, like fakeness on Instagram and stuff like that. Um, so I put it out and it did like all right uh, after a day. And I was like, oh, that's grand. And then it started to pick up views and views overnight, but it got a lot of dislikes. Okay. Because basically there's sort of three groups of people who watch the video. The last group don't really comment, but the first group are like, Thomas is a dickhead. He's a negative Nancy and he's trying to shit on Rob's career. That's number one. They leave comments such as focus on yourself, dickhead, and think more about being positive. The second group of people hate how I interviewed him because I avoided certain topics because I only had 24 hours to film it. So I don't know Rob so well that I can ask him really personal questions. And just as a human being, I was like, I'm going to ask him the best questions that I can. Uh, given my time constraints and I'm not going to try and overstay my welcome because he was gracious enough to allow me into his home. Those people are saying, 
I don't want to say it, well, I'm going to say it anyway. It's like, Thomas is a pussy for not asking the hard questions. And then the third group of people, which are the people that uh, I think will relate to, would be people who haven't really seen this other side of Rob before. It's like this external guy who goes into Rob's house. He asks him some questions. It's an interesting story. And I think Rob's a good guy. And that's the conclusion I came out of it. Like, I know him as a person um, from the four or five times that I've worked with him, and he's been an absolute gent. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to see if there was a different perspective out of that. Yeah. But in short, because that's so pol polarizing, the fanboys are hating the video, and there's other people who are liking it. And because of that, I think it's being shared around in, like, WhatsApp groups. So people are calling me a hero or a dickhead, and that's driving sort of growth other than the algorithm things I already pointed out. I actually, came, it's really interesting that you say that because I actually came across this um, quote. I, I came across this thing that basically said that the best brands in the world are the most polarizing. So um, Thank you for saying I'm the best brand in the world. So. <laughs> no, no, but in, 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 in general, like things that have like different think, opinions. Or even like in other words, like if, you know, if, if you put out something into the world and you get a neutral response, uh, that's maybe one of the, the worst things that could happen, you know, exactly. like you, you want to be able to evoke some form of, uh, you know, trigger mm. or, or action or emotion and just shifting gears a little bit. Um, thanks for that, for that analysis, because it's interesting to, I think for a lot of the viewers as well to know that you don't necessarily have need to have, uh, you know, the most like liked video or have like a hundred percent like rate or whatever, rather, um, it's, uh, as you mentioned, it's a, a combination of, uh, the things that you've mentioned around, like the, the watch duration. Uh, and a couple of the other things as well, but just shifting gears, one of the the groups that's obviously notorious uh, when it comes to uh, building, you know, kind of like trust and, and resonance with is students, obviously. And you see every day, and it's you know sometimes it's uh, it's it's a bit you know interesting to watch, but like all these brands trying to get their attention, trying to be uh, cool, which is cringy. Just just thinking of it. What have your What are your thoughts and views on on that, and how some of the brands that that have you know done it right, some of the brands that are uh, that that you know, some of the brands that are have done right, and just general tactics about that. Mm. Yeah, student demographic is probably one of the hardest to yeah. to break into because they have such a high bullshit meter, um, and you know if you look at stuff like Vodafone did a recent campaign which was to do with what's the funniest college, mm. so they tried to take a stereotype of UCC, UCD, and DCU pit them against each other and it could be like something that students wanted to engage in but if you click onto their youtube channel there's so many dislikes in the videos because they're not authentic and it's an example of a business trying to reach the student demographic but not really knowing what it's like to be a student so number one i think if you can't make original content through a person that could hit like the student demographic i'd be sponsoring them so i'd be sponsoring people like me people who already have that younger demographic because they tend to be kids anyway people who speak the same language 100 percent. as opposed to kind of trying and you know, <laughs> you know as opposed to trying to speak their language actually exactly, yeah. partner with someone who already does because like i'd reckon that students influencers they're, they're probably going to be micro influencers they're going to be so much cheaper than paying someone who's like the top of their field so that's one thing and then mm. secondly if you're trying to reach students i'd be trying to do branding around an individual yeah. so if you have someone in your business say for example who's an intern I'd be pitching to them to say, look, we'd love to start a podcast or a vlog around you because we know you're, you probably have to, you have to be good on camera and you have to be someone who could be relatable yep. and we're going to push that out. And then that's sort of organically going to generate to the student viewers. How I did it was that I'm in UCD and I was like, okay, how can I build content? How can I make consistent content? I'll just build it around my student life. So five things I wish I did in first year. These are like examples of listicles, which were big back in the day. Um, you know, how, how are they these days, by the way? Uh, like they were, they're not as relevant, but they definitely work. Um, again, though, you have to be super relevant to the time. So say, for example, when Krispy Kreme was coming out, if you were to do like if a dentist had put up something along the lines of five reasons why Krispy Kreme will save your teeth or something weird like that that could really work, grab attention but they're not as they're definitely not as big anymore so in, in in your instance then like completely agree there like makes a lot of sense for you to constantly be up with the time and sort of something like Krispy Kreme opening up there's already so much attention going towards it so sort of hopping on that bandwagon and, and making the most of it so I guess what would your advice be to anyone looking to sort of identify these trends and keep up with them you know so first of all you have to be consuming the platform that you want to go 
be, go big on. So there's no point you wanting to build a YouTube channel and you never spending time on YouTube. Yeah. So if you're not willing to put in that time, you're going to have to outsource that to someone who consumes it a lot because the only way I'm aware of topics and stuff to make videos on is because I'm always on YouTube. So I, I'm, I'm always have an eye out for what's... You're always switched on to what's going on at the moment. Yeah, yeah but like from a more practical level, I'll hop onto the app, I'll go into the trending page and see what's trending. Mm. And if there's bits and pieces of these videos that I can use, that's perfect because YouTube is moving away from subscriptions yes. and it's more to do with recommended videos and the home feed. Mm -hmm. So the home feed is full of videos where people like me or like you have watched before and the algorithm knows it has a good watch time and it knows it had a, has a good click through rate. So it knows it's going to make money on the ads it serves you. So to get yourself into that recommended, you're going to have to be making videos again that have sort of good watch time. And the only way you're going to know that is by consuming the app. So that's, that's quite a long winded way of saying that if you're not actively on it and testing stuff, you're never going to know what to put out and how to grow stuff. And that's obviously relevant like on YouTube, but also on any other, uh, platform that you're looking to get into and one of the things as well is around uh let's talk about hash i, I love how how tactical you are uh, <laughs> straight uh, to the point <laughs> you know let's talk about hashtags for example you know there's so much when you're trying to put a post out you would start looking at some of the hashtags that you put and naturally you just put like literally like the the actual keywords that are there but more often than not you find that the hashtags that really get to a particular group are sometimes not related to that keyword at all or that keyword you know spelt in a different way or just a fucking different word completely that just banana you know that just happens to be talking to folks who love expensive watches for instance you know mm -hmm. so for somebody who is looking to to take you up on that and and and, and looking to become kind of like a uh, a student of the market to kind of learn all this stuff where do they even start their research process to come up with i mean not to not to be too specific, but literally to come up with the specific hashtags that they should be going after. So first of all, like you've got to decide what audience do I need to get? And then you're going to look at the social platforms and ask yourself which people are consuming these platforms. So I'll give an example of what I think is relevant for 2018. If you want to, <clears throat> if you want to get to anybody, particularly young people, Instagram, if you want to go to older people, you go to Facebook. If you want to go to young girls, you want to go to Snapchat. If you want to go to Twitter, um, that's just young people in general uh, and LinkedIn is more for professionals. YouTube is aging up a bit, but it's, it's pretty, pretty much everybody. Um, so once you've decided that, then you've <coughs> just got to work back to relevant tactics to get them to consume your stuff. So to deal with the hashtag thing, hashtags are obviously very relevant on uh, Instagram. Yep. Now Instagram are actually going to phase out seeing hashtags in the post because basically what happens is that for someone like me who knows that hashtags grow organic reach, I'm going to put them in. But for other people, they might feel embarrassed to think that their, their, their friends might see it and be like, oh, you're putting in so many hashtags. So what's going to happen is that you can put in hashtags, but you won't see it in the comment section. So people won't feel insecure and they can still put in hashtags okay. to grow the reach of their post. So in yeah. Instagram starting to do that. Yeah, that's I've read that in the news recently. That's which... actually that's actually pretty interesting. And and do you think hashtags in general are effective? Uh, like, and is there a sort of best practice as to uh, the amount of hashtags that you should use? You know, is like or should you always go for thirty? You know, exactly. Should you go for thirty, or like would it be more meaningful for you to pick like two and like stick to them religiously? And like, have, so in your own experience, just playing around with that what, what mm. have you noticed works best so my hashtag game on instagram is not the best but in an ideal world yeah you would use 30 for me i don't always have time to like figure out what are the best ones i have a slightly different tactic in that i rely a lot on face-to-face -face engagement with people mm -hmm. and then getting them to follow me on social so the people who like my stuff i either know them personally and i'm answering their dms and it's like a very genuine relationship if yeah. that makes sense I've, I've not not to go on a tangent but i've i've actually know like noticed that more so than than usual because i've noticed that um like i follow you on instagram vice versa and <laughs> <laughs> no no but but I've, I've i've noticed that like if so other than the fact that you're just ridiculously active on stories and not just like posts every day but like stories and so on um if i ever comment on any of your stories you usually answer really quickly and sa same with me, like putting up a story, I would notice that you would sort of reply quite quickly. I just and, love you. I mean, <laughs> I don't, I don't blame you, man. I don't blame you. <laughs> but um, 
How much but, are you paying for that? <laughs> <laughs> we, we planned this before, before the show. Um, no, but in general, like, ov- obviously you're doing this with, with a lot of people and it may seem as something that, you know, that would take up a lot of time and like be a lot of, uh, like a big hassle, but it we would, I guess we, we'd both agree that it would actually be something that pays off a lot more because automatically that your eye would only catch a few um, sort of names or profiles or thing like sort of pictures that you'd see in your sort of newsfeed or stories that you'd sort of that would catch your eye more so than others purely because you feel like you have a relationship there mm-hmm. same, same sort of logic with a close friend of yours posting something on instagram no matter how pathetic it may be <laughs> you you may actually just so show some sympathy and actually engage with it for once rather than someone putting up something where you know they're diving out of a plane but you vaguely know them so you may not actually engage with them so like do, do you think that's something that a brand would be able to do because i feel that in my own experience people engage on instagram specifically with people much more so than brands yeah and do you think that's something that can carry over with a brand uh, yeah so like even from a sorry to go tactical again but <laughs> even to go algorithmically on that as well like instagram knows what photos you're putting up so it has this doesn't work on the iphone anymore but basically what used to be able to happen was if you took a picture and you took like you're able to copy it and put it into your notes app it would say tree say we took a, a photo of outside it would say tree green grass blue sky uh, same with instagram pictures it knows it can recognize faces and they tend to just get a lot more engagement so that's why people okay. like people from a strategic point of view okay. but other than that i think it's very important for brands to it's easy for me because i'm myself i'm not another entity on social so i can reply as me and the questions always excuse me Questions always tend to veer around college, so CAO applications, what it's like being an intern, Mm. uh, and then it's stuff revolving around YouTube, so how to start a YouTube channel, Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest of it's like, oh, I found, why do I keep burping? I found that, (laughs) I had a burrito before I came here, Um, (laughs) I found a video very funny, or I thought that story was very funny, et cetera, et cetera, but the brands that are really excelling on social are the ones who are responding to all their fans, like Aer Lingus. And their social media on Twitter, their customer service is fantastic. They they have a bit of humor and how they respond to people and they act like a human. So you got to remember that everybody who responds to your posts could be a potential advocate of your brand yes. if they chose to do it in the first place. Certainly. And it, with a bit of effort on your part, and it's only a bit of effort, it's not even hard. It's like you just send a quick little reply back. It's much more of the thought than the actual effort. Yeah, you like their post, you might follow them, you respond mm-hmm. to their story, and all of a sudden you have someone who's built a bit of a relationship and they're far more sticky. They're going to stick with you. You know, you can, re- we always thought like as a business, you're always thinking, how can I retain customers? It's the same thing with an audience. If you can, response to their comments on a regular basis you're, you're going to retain their attention for a lot more even even if like the i guess the, the image that you see on instagram may not be a picture of like someone that you know but could be a brand but as long as that human connection is there is it's yeah it, it would work really well so shifting gears once more all right Great phrase to, <laughs> pointing the camera towards <coughs> you um what's next for tom arnold so I know that you, you're currently doing your internship in Microsoft. Mm-hmm. You're doing a lot of freelance video work. Uh, not as much as last year. Not as yeah, much as last year. I have a lot of time at work, but yeah. So out of, I guess, in, in, in your own mind, what's what's the game plan for you next? Like, what, what, what are you looking to do? Like, are you looking to sort of go all in on video after, you know, like you're done with, with Microsoft or so on? Or like, are you looking to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So in short, I don't know. Um. <laughs> I'm. No one really does, right? Yeah. Nobody really does. Why do I keep coughing? <coughs> um. I'm focused at the moment on being the best intern I can be, uh, growing my social media as much as I can outside of work, and doing freelance just to get a bit of extra cash. To be honest. Yeah. Um. If I there's a few different routes I can take. I still have to go back and do final year. So. When I'm finished, do I want to do freelance full time? If I was to do that, I'd be making a production company because from experience in business, you don't hire an individual. Corporates anyway, look to hire an entity. So if I was to go down the freelance route, I'd probably do that. Mm -hmm. I could obviously apply for graduate programs once I've finished college, or I could try and do social media full time. But to be honest, as a person, I definitely work better when I'm doing a few things at once. Yeah. So I let people always say, oh, how are you? You're so busy doing a lot of different things. But I like doing stuff outside of work. Yeah. So the YouTube and social media in general is a bit of a passion project. It would be lovely in the future to get some additional income through brand deals and stuff. Yeah. But at the moment, I'm just focused on growing it 
That's what they can't. I need a bit of water. <laughs> it's not that I'm crying. Man, I, I told you not to go for the crying. spicy burrito, man. That's, that's, <laughs> that salsa, oh, man, it's, it's mean. Um, but you're well on your way, though. I mean, you're you're obviously growing, and you know, from from that, like you're only gonna. Uh... But like, you're only as good as your last video. Like, you're only good That's as true. your last at bat. Like, everybody's like, people who don't make videos or don't have a following, they're like, they think, oh well, you're at that. You know, Musk always talks about it, the point of critical mass, yeah. where you know you'll ascend into affinity like Buzz Lightyear. But that's not how it works. <laughs> Everything is you have to be so relevant on YouTube. The video I made a video way prematurely about Santa. I was it was called Undercover as Santa Claus because there's a lot of undercover videos doing well. Okay. And I thought maybe if I did it early, it might work, but it just bombed. Like it didn't do well. So you're only as good as your last video, and you have to constantly be you know, working on what's relevant, what audience you're serving, your how your audience changes. Like I moved from a college audience to more of a younger audience. Mm -hmm. Now I'm getting hate from an older <laughs> audience. Do I serve the younger audience or do I serve the older one? What videos yeah. do I want to It's almost make? like being a basketball player where you're only as good as your last kind of game or performance, you know? Yeah, nobody, yeah. people remember... I might be getting a lot of hate right now, but next week people are probably going to forget, you know, in a month. So you've got to constantly be trying to one up yourself and make the best stuff you can make yeah. and ultimately i think if you're a brand you definitely have to stand for something yeah like i'm happy to stand behind that rob lipsa video because it is genuinely good content yeah you may hate it you may hate me but i don't give a fuck it's because there's stuff behind it there's a message and that was me being genuine trying to answer those questions yeah. and it's something that i actually care about and for the people who have the same values as me they're going to care about uh, my brand as well yep. so you can't just be a dead fish in this game you have to actually stand for something you know absolutely that's true that's the life of an influencer <laughs> <laughs> tom thank you so much for your awesome. time today. anytime boys always a pleasure to, uh, to have you on the episode <laughs> and we'll uh, we'll see you around yeah Try for sure it's huh? over next <laughs>